This is not a walk in the park when you're in the middle of the ocean and, and the storms are raging, the waves are big, and it's just you against the clock. And in the words of Napoleon to his generals, you can ask for anything except time. And when the clock is ticking, time, time, time is your enemy. Time, time, it ticks away. I think land is about 100 kilometres that way. We just stopped for half an hour to have some breakfast, uh, just a little bit of servicing on the engines. A bit intimidating being this far offshore. This is the furthest offshore I've ever been. Earthrace founder and skipper Pete Bethune, six months prior to his world circumnavigation attempt and on only his first offshore voyage. Pete didn't have a lot of experience with sailing, especially going long distances offshore. But he looked at the record of 75 days and just thought there seemed to be a lot of fat in that record. 75 days seemed like a long time to circumnavigate the globe. Pete repeatedly said, I'm going to set out and break this record. I can do it. This record is there to be broken. And not just broken, but smashed. And having come out and said that so many times, he had to follow through and do that. And in many ways with Earthrace, when he set out, he created a monster. I'm Stephen John Scheidler. And in actually 1997, Dag Pike and I set up the rules for a round the world powerboat race. There's actually been hundreds and hundreds that have raced around the world in sailboats, but uh, no one had really raced or tried to set a record around the world in a powerboat. And this is not easy. There's easy people who have done it a long, long time ago, and they haven't, and it's really only one boat, only one boat really made it around the world. A big, very expensive boat with full sponsorship. And uh, they did it their way and were able to do it, but it wasn't easy. In 1998, four boats set out to attempt the world record circumnavigation. The custom-built boat, cable and wireless, with accommodation for 14 crew, was the only boat to finish, completing its circumnavigation in 74 days and 23 hours. It would be a very different experience for the three Earth Race crew, who would be spending the entire journey in a 16 square meter living area. At 24,000 nautical miles, the powerboating circumnavigation is the world's longest race. We need to do a consent form. Yep. So there's a procedure. We... So if you just put that hand up on your chest. So this is the bit that we're after. The fatty bit there. So you can just turn your right round. Put that hand up. So we've got the same area here. Okay. It's funny, it sort of seemed it seemed like a sort of joke up till now. <laughs> it sounded like, well, we're getting serious now. <laughs> and Auckland sailor has undergone liposuction to prove his own body fat can be used to help power a trimaran around the world. Peter Bethune's body fat will be converted into biofuel. Uh, what we're hoping to do from this is um, make some biodiesel out of the out of the fat that they get out of me, and uh, it's one of those stories that should go around the globe. We think a um, little little bit of a stunt, I guess, but it does highlight for people the fact that you can use lots of different sources uh, to make biodiesel from. I have to believe that half an hour ago it was floating around in the That's right. in my loins. Yeah, kisses goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> The overall theme behind the project was the promotion of renewable energy and specifically biodiesel. And the boat was to be run on 100% pure biodiesel for the race attempt. Well now my kitchen's been taken over by Pete. He's in there brewing human fat to make biodiesel and making a um, lovely mess in there which I hope he will clean up. Are they running? Yes, so I'm about to go into work and when I come home I expect that it will be all clean and tidy and out of my kitchen. <laughs> Throughout its world tour and record attempt, the Earth Race boat would run on biodiesel sourced from a variety of materials, from rapeseed to fish oil, in order to highlight the potential and versatility of renewable fuels. Pete has always tended to go full on. Nothing's sort of simple. I expected this to be over and done with three months, hop in a boat, go around the world, but it's been three years and we've already um, gone over what he first estimated it would cost by quite a considerable amount and I didn't think it could go over any more <laughs> but it has so yeah no it's a bit stressful we've got um the bills piling up and how much is this boat costing it's um 
yeah, I know it's it's a dream and it's going to be great when it's done, but it's just, yeah, it's hard to fathom the amount of money that's going into it. Earthrace was designed purely to break the existing round the world record. It's, it's a totally unique custom design specifically for that purpose. We were given a, an open brief. We pretty much took it to the extreme. For hundreds, thousands of years, it's been the view of people that go to sea is you want to stay ab above the water. You know, piercing or going under the water for periods of time is something that's been avoided at all costs. The wave piercing nature of the craft is something that's very unusual. Uh, there's very few wave piercing or full wave piercing crafts in the world. We've discovered through our research and development that actually piercing through the waves it allows the vessel to maintain high speeds and rough conditions where other vessels would have to slow down. Construction of the craft started, in our opinion, way before it should have. Um, it was started before all of the design information had been completed. It was started before the costing could be completed because it's a, a custom design. Uh, essentially, all of the moulds and tooling to, to generate the shape were one-off. Everything is done for the first time. The first time we saw Earth Race in the water, it was, was absolutely outstanding, amazing to see. You got your bottle? Yeah, we've got to get you up there looking ladylike on the bow. Normally after the boat's launched, you spend a lot of time commissioning, sea trialling, uh, developing an understanding of the boat so you can enhance it, improve it and get the best out of it. In this situation, the boat was launched and off it went on around the New Zealand trial, uh, visit tour and then off overseas. Uh, it was just wasn't sufficient opportunity to, to really learn anything about it. Off, gone, away on, on the, the joyous bit, I guess, of port tours and, and having fun with the lads rather than focusing on getting a very clear understanding of the boat and how to, to get it right. Quite as big as we thought, eh? Nah, this is dodgy as f this, eh? The circumnavigation rules state that the skipper and navigator must remain the same and complete the entire voyage on board. With Pete as skipper, Ryan Heron, the onboard cameraman, would be registered as the navigator for the world record attempt. Scratchy out. Yeah. Don't know how we're going to manage doing it when we're in rough seas trying to pull them in. But I guess we'll overcome that obstacle when we get to it. After two years of trying to get the boat in the water, suddenly we found ourselves having to navigate around New Zealand. Between Pete, Tim, and myself, uh, we had very, very little boating experience. But finding good nautical crew that were willing to work in the conditions of the Earth Race and work for free proved difficult. You want to have a chat on the radio? On Beach Hop FM? Yeah, why not? Okay. One of the most important aspects of the NZ promotional tour was getting the press on side for each port that we visited. If we got good coverage in newspaper, TV and radio, people would see that and come down and visit the boat. People would give a donation to come on board, so we needed the people to come down so we could raise money, not only to fund the New Zealand tour, but also to pay off some debts that Pete still owed from the build, and also to finish off the interior of the boat. There was no galley whatsoever, and Earthrace basically wasn't fit to go offshore. It's the last day of our New Zealand promotional tour today. It's been a long haul. It's been about seven weeks on, on the road and on the boat. It's, it has been pretty tiring. It's, you know, it's just been go, go, go the whole time. Um, even on our days off, we've got so, much, so many things to catch up on that you, you just kind of don't get any time off. Earth race right now, it's, it's a privilege to work on this. Crew spirit is good. Crew spirit is real good. Yeah, I'm feeling, feeling quite, quite, um, what am I feeling? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not sure on, on Timmy's, um, I guess he's, he's, he's high maintenance at times and he's struggling financially and that, but it's not like we've sort of got the money to go paying him either, you know, so I'm, 
you know, I'm not, not sure what's going to develop there. Like most things in Earth race, it tends to evolve, so we'll see what happens. See you, boy. She's heading away. Make sure you have one aside now. So is this it? With the boat's interior still incomplete, the Earth race begins a 10,000 kilometer Pacific crossing. With three new crew members on board and an old face missing, an intense nine months of touring awaits the new team before their March 10th race start. Pete's an extremely focused guy. Um, once he's got his mind set on something, uh, he goes for it and really nothing else matters other than achieving that goal. And uh, yeah, consequently people um, get left by the wayside. Pete did renege on his promise by deciding that he wasn't going to put me on the boat crew at all, which only left me the option of paying my own way, which given the fact that I've worked for 15 months or 16 months or something for no pay, where, where did he imagine I would find the two grand or whatever to pay for the, pay for the ticket to get over? Peter's a one-of-a-kind guy that does what's best for Pete, always. There we go! I'm sure the last thing he was thinking was that he was, he was about to renege on, uh, you know, a long-standing deal. He just did what he needed to do for Pete to get his boat happening. It took us a month to get the boat across the Pacific. And when we arrived, we had only four hours rest before beginning our first promotions in North America. Two of the guys that came across on the Earth race or helped us get the boat across the Pacific weren't interested in staying on the boat, so we were down to three boat crew for the North American tour. It's a boat that's been built to attempt the round the world speed Slow your like accent how. down for me. Okay, tell me again, what is biodiesel? A renewable fuel that's made normally from vegetable oils, but you can make it Would from animal fats and fish oils. Would you please slow your accent down? A whole range of things. Right. Slow your accent All down right. for me. Okay, yeah. tell me again, what is biodiesel? Without sufficient monetary resources or crew, the team race from port to port down the west coast of the United States, seeking much-needed sponsorship dollars and media attention for the project, whilst continuing to run promotions for renewable fuels. That's just a side effect. Just coming into San Francisco. Crack it down, this looking forward to it. So, so where we at on, on media and stuff? Oh man, uh, we had uh, a press conference scheduled for 10 a.m. today and of course nobody showed up except for the newsletter guy. Yeah. Hey, um, if the Chronicle's not running anything, is it worth with my while just going and hitting those guys up and seeing if we can't get a story rolling maybe. Yeah, absolutely. If you show up there with your Kiwi accent and put on your charm, they I don't think they can deny you. No, it's just an editorial assistant. Oh, and I spoke with Oh, excuse me, hey, we'll take it. We're wondering if we could have a have a, a brief audience with you. It would do be so. It would do me a huge favor if you would allow us in. Seems like Robert's struggling with this. Like I would have thought it would be a shoo-in for a story at the Chronicle here, but just don't don't want to meet us. All right. Well, thank you. All right. No, everyone's on deadline working right now. So it is a lot harder than I thought. I thought I'd get the boat over to the states right. and it'd all fall into place. We've got no money for our insurance at the moment. The boat's uninsured. Just. Hard, hard yakka right now. Sharon's got no money, she can't pay the electricity and phone. We've mortgaged the house right up to as much as we can. We've sold the forestry block, which was about 150,000, which was, like I said, our superannuation. Peak shares in the company, which we've sold. Get off the bench. It's not meant to be on the bench. Yeah, who wants possum? 
Go and play with Lishi. I only work 30 hours a week, so it doesn't go very far, unfortunately, when you've got two children and a house with a mortgage and, and things. Pete's under enormous pressure at the moment. Some of the stress that Pete must be feeling is affecting his decision making. It's one thing that's become clearer to us as the tour's gone on, is that the Earthrace Open Days uh, are not going to raise enough money to, to fund the world record attempt. So I'm going to head away from the tour for a week or so and just try and generate some significant sponsorship. Without a large corporate backer, Pete and Sharon have invested over a million US dollars into Earthrace, all of their personal funds. And with weekly running costs of $15,000, the project is on a financial knife edge. Let's do a wee tour through the boat. One of the weird things about the project is um, just there's no personal space. You're always around the crew and we've had about 40,000 people essentially through our bedroom in the past couple of months. We're putting the Better Bodies or logo on the side of the boat. These wonderful, these wonderful people are sponsoring our fuel for the North American tour and the race. It's going to be an important relationship for us with uh, Better Buy Diesel. Very beneficial. I mean, it's, it's crucial for us to get this, this uh, fuel sponsor tied up. It has all gone horribly wrong. <laughs> it's a good way to end the West Coast tour on a very positive note. Having the fuel sorted is a massive expense taken care of. It's worth about 250 grand to us. It's a funny time, it's a funny day actually, because after this is over, the boat's going to head down to Acapulco and Mexico and, and onwards to the Panama Canal. We've had three months touring here in the US. And we still haven't managed to find another boat crew member. But we've got two temporary crew on board to help the guys get the boat down to Panama and through the canal. We've got the pilot just about to jump on our vessel, but he's a little bit worried, I think. Normally they're hopping on great big uh, freighters and stuff. So. into the first lock on the western side of the Panama Canal. So, um, yeah, we're just keeping everything tidy so we don't go tripping and falling into the locks. This is nerve-wracking as hell. They got these wicked currents here coming out. Just pulling in behind, I've got this boat Santiago in front of us. It's a Panamax and it's got two foot clearance either side. Just a really tight fit. Pretty intense, the uh, water's rushing everywhere. I can see what they mean when it's surgy. Well, I want to be in there. I can say this in all candor, that this boat, with hot weather conditions and high humidity, is the most uncomfortable boat I've ever been on. We literally have people sitting in the pilot and co-pilot seat drenched, literally dripping with sweat. No cold drinks and no ventilation. It's a problem, it needs to be fixed. The sea was flat, so we saw the boat coming from miles off. But it wasn't until it started getting closer that we realised it was heading straight for us, that, that it was chasing us. And that's when we began to get concerned. Awesome, what's happening? Uh, we're just being approached by a boat. So we're just uh, about 200 miles off the Nicaragua coast, and um, they're asking us to stop, and they can't give us a break. Let's outrun them, bro. They can't catch us in that boat. I know you want us to stop, but I need to know who you are, over. They've got guns. What's that, mate? They've got guns. Yeah, we've got pirates here, mate, and uh, I'm not f***ing 
everybody, this is scary, mate. I do not want to stop for you guys. I don't know if you are happy or not, Over. I, I don't see a Columbia Navy uh, flag on your boat, and uh, we do not want to stop for you, over. filming? It turned out it was the Colombian Navy. They searched the boat for cocaine, um, gratefully took a few of our posters and uh, took off. It wasn't till months later that we discovered the bullet hole in the starboard horn of the boat, but after the whole ordeal we had the best swim of our lives. Quite a few people come down to Earth Race and they think, what a fantastic thing you're doing. They yet they don't know the reality of it. When you rush things, it all turns to shit, which is what's happened quite a bit on this journey. So sort of, I'm feeling the stress of it as well. Occasionally we have a good spurt um, where yeah, we get money or something works for us for a change, but often it's just rush, rush and turns to shit. Sort of decided that I'm quite keen to go home. Just heard from uh, our exclusive fuel sponsor, Better Buy Diesel, that uh, they're unable to come up with any more cash or fuel. Uh, not great news. And we've also lost Torsten from the boat for it. He's decided to leave. Um, not quite sure where that leaves us, but just about to go and have a chat with Pete and, uh, and talk about it. Pete. All right, we'll keep track of you. Seriously, what have you done? Better bodies are in a financial bind at the moment. They don't have any money or fuel at all for us. Oh, man. So we've got no fuel to get to Houston? No. All we can do is we go and check the tanks and see how much we got. How much cash we got? About two and a half K in the bank, plus whatever we take today. But without them doing the fuel... With little fuel or cash, the team dry docks the boat in Charleston and with the help of volunteers from throughout the country, prepares the boat for a race they can't yet afford. We're gutting the boat of absolutely everything that's not essential for the race. And part of that is the sound system, so the amps coming out. We haven't got the resources to actually do the race or even buy the fuel. But Pete keeps behaving as if the money will come from somewhere. So we had a weather window closing in on us, and we also had contractual obligations with our sponsors to start the race. So not starting the race wasn't an option. And I managed to find a company in Puerto Rico that agreed to supply biodiesel for the first two legs of the race. 
So we decided to start the race, and then my job was to try and raise the rest of the fuel as the boat was racing. In essence, I was in each port of call, trying to raise the fuel as the boat was coming towards me. It was crazy. See you, mate. Hey, we will see you in, uh, see you in Panama. Yep. I want some fuel when I get there, No right? problem. <laughs> With the fuel to undertake the first two legs of the race, a new crew member, engineer Anthony Di Stefano, and two new ground crew members handling the race logistics with John, the Earth Race team, after four years of construction, touring and planning, are in a position to start their attempt at the world circumnavigation record. We're all going to get up early and have a champagne breakfast and sort of toast the boat when it leaves at 7 o'clock from Barbados. Uh, it's like real time now because it's Every time that we uh, work on our part of the job and logistics, uh, the boat's running, it's coming towards us, so uh, the pressure will be on. The start vessel for Earth race, do you copy on 1-6, over. You guys ready? Yeah bro, this is it eh? Yeah, this is it. There we go. Cheers. I had like three hours sleep last night and I can't go to sleep now. I'm wired. Unreal. Just crazy to have actually started this, you know? It's been years and years. And uh, finally on our way. 1,230 nautical miles to go to the Panama Canal. And just a wonderful way to start the race if we were to just really nail this first leg. There's a funny vibration just started. We a few small vibrations on the way, but they now just seems to be consistent. I think it's a prop, but I can't see anything. Just gonna see if I can get a mask on that one. They come into bits. There's, there's no way they'll last the race, no way at all. I mean this set has only lasted not even a full leg. Their, uh, their stuff. They would make it to uh, San Diego. No, I don't reckon. Ha <laughs> ha! How are you, mate? I got some bad news. These props are they're, uh, getting stuff. There's quite a large chunk out of them. Like in terms of the race on these, I don't, I don't think these props will last. But uh, a little bit lost in what, what we should be doing here. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's kind of puts us in a pinch. Uh, we have to figure we something out pretty quickly. And I remember going to bed last night thinking, I hope these props last the race. Wouldn't did I know they wouldn't last the first leg. Look at this pitch. Look how it's curved over. Oh, these are quite nice. 18 hours into the race, we had our first major problem. The carbon fiber props, new technology, latest and greatest, supposed to be the most efficient method of propelling a boat, started to disintegrate. And this left us with a twofold problem. We had to, we had to find new props that match Earth Race, which nothing matches Earth Race because she's such a special boat. And we had to see if we could get the money back, a refund from our carbon fiber props to pay for the new props that we need immediately. I'm trying to get a shot of the props here. Give her a shot. Here's what, uh, here's what the captain has suggested, that uh, we get an entire new setup. The captain has suggested that you make us an entire new hub and uh, blade set. Well, through the power of communication, computers, cell phones, Skype, 
We managed to get the props sorted today. I'm amazed to say that it all looks like it's a go, and I can't see that any other way could have gotten this done any faster. So it's like 38 degrees Celsius right now, it's freaking hot. There's no air conditioning. There's five of us in here all sweating 24 7 pretty much. And then we don't have one bed each, we all rotate between them. So the skin does just get filthy. So a baby wipe once a day is uh, in order. Balls last. Three crew wasn't enough to run the boat at speed on a long voyage, but Pete saw an opportunity to solve two of our problems by selling the fourth and fifth crew positions for five or ten thousand dollars a leg. Um, these guys would come on board, take their turn cooking, maybe drive the boat for a stretch during the day and just generally take a bit of the load off the main crew. Two day journey became a four day journey because uh, we've had some problems. We've run out of water and this has effectively become our water supply, high energy drink, doesn't really lend them much sleep. Okay. You see the boats almost at Panama. The Panama Canal entrance is right about there. And looks like they've got about 40 or 50 miles to go. This is the real problem right there. See, because once that starts to erode out the hub, it'll, it'll well, just yeah, keep walking down the whole thing. And, and then it'll just snap off. We're testing the quality of the fuel as it came out of the trucks. It's called a flip test. So we're going to go one, two, Yeah, it's not looking so good. See all the free floaty, the micro? Mm, no. Get it in there and we just leave the conditioner running overnight. Sounds good. Yeah. The props arrived that night, which meant we ended up with a 36 hour delay in Panama. But it was a huge team effort to get the props there in that short of time. But it was our first race stop, so we knew we'd have to do better from there on in. It's amazing how much effort has gone to get these two props in here tonight. <laughs> Looking forward to getting into that water? Not really, when you've got all the locals saying don't dive in there because there's crocodiles through there. Okay. These seem to have a nice clean bite all the way to the hub, which means more water flow, more speed and a better chance at achieving our record. It's kind of weird, we're, we're back in this race and we're doing 1.2 knots coming, coming into the canal. Uh, two minutes. It's going to be nice to get out into the ocean again and crank it to some speed, be good. The Power Boating World Circumnavigation Rules state that the vessel must be under 120 feet that the skipper and the navigator must complete the entire voyage on board, and that the boat must pass through both the Panama and Suez canals. So these train 
planes right over here, these locomotives, they weigh about 100 tons, and they can put out about 100 tons of pulling force, and they're locked down to the tracks. So last I heard, only two locomotives have ever actually been pulled off the track and dumped into the water. And I don't know whatever happened to the conductor. three locks to go through now before we're down into the Pacific. Very stressful in these canals, the currents and that moved the boat around and had a couple of close calls, so looking forward to open water again. Now, and everyone is shattered at the moment, I can see walking around, everyone's just very knackered. Big day, getting everything together for getting through the locks. We got our props on, everything sorted. Had about two hours sleep, earth race standard. I'm looking forward to getting out to sea and falling asleep. Hopefully it's not rough and sleep is an option. Our fourth crew member for the leg is actually a doctor who's flown down from New York for the voyage and he's done a bit of boating before which is handy. We're through. Yeah, we're through. <laughs> we're through. We're through. Cheers for your help man. Bye bye. Looks like something's gone wrong with the starboard engine, not sure what yet. Another f problem. There's oil on the floor in the bilge, and there's a, there's a big leak somewhere in the starboard engine. Haven't found it yet. Just got to do a bit of digging and uh, find out where this oil's coming from. We don't know which side it is, really. If it gets in the hole, it can sneak out. Anyway, what we'll do, we'll clean it up the best we can. Disappointing. We need to have those parts waiting for us. They're able to run at 16 knots. The old record was set at 16.1 knots, and so they're able to maintain position with the old record. Pete and Anthony have been back and forth between that engine bay and the helm for the past 30 hours now, and they try something, put the engine back together, doesn't work. They both look so downcast, then they head back down there. I'm gonna go back to the living hell for the next three hours, and then... Uh, I'll tell you what, I'm I'm really Yeah. And I think um, we do 15 knots, we grab a couple hours sleep, we get up and pull it to bits then. All right, fair enough, I'm good with that. Um, we can, I think we can weld it though. Having only three proper crew on board left us all exhausted if something went wrong. In this particular time, for Anthony, or for, for all of us involved, it went horribly wrong. Hello! Help! Ready? Help! One more. How many do you want, Tomas? You need, a, you need a help, dude. Just tell me what to do. Take him up inside. Is, is there another guy? Is there one more? Hey, amigo, try some brace? Yes. Okay. Hola! Uh, do we have any other spotlights? Yeah. Oh, that is a pillow. Here's yeah. an oxygen tank. Let me go grab the regulator, okay? Should've just been in the water. Should've just jumped in. I saw him, bro. In la cabeza? <coughs> no. Mira. Let's go on. Wait a minute. Can I just see his eyes for a oh. second? Let me see some light in his eyes. I'm looking at it. 
Is this our spotlight now? Okay, that's good. The spotlight's f***ed, guys. The lead's come out. Oh, God. Hey, hey, hey. <sighs> Hold on. I got it. I'm right. It wasn't your fault, bro. I got it. Hello! Help! Hello! Hay otros barcas cerca de aquí? O sea, que había otras lanchas. ¿Tres lanchas? Había tres lanchas más anterior de nosotros. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Remember vessel Earth Race, Earth Race, Earth Race. Position 134676 six, North, 912928 West. We have a collision with a small launch. People in the water. No, no. I think, the, I think he's dead. We don't have any cigarettes, do we? He's no, 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 no. Things have got really f***ed up here on the boat. We hit a small skiff with three fishermen on board. Um, we are currently circling the position. We've got two of them on the boat, but we're still missing uh, a third individual. The skipper of the skiff is still missing overboard. and We can't find him, Ellie. Amigos, tiene radios? Sí. Sí? Okay. Just tapón, 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 ¿me escucha? Gato, ¿me escucha? Just searching, um, circling the spot that we marked when we hit the skiff. The impact was about an hour and a half ago now. So the guy's probably dead for sure. Uh, 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 uh. He is bleeding internally and this doesn't give him red cells or oxygen carrying potential but it keeps his uh, heart and his blood flowing. He'll, it'll lower his hematocrit, he'll have like an anemia, but at least he'll keep his blood pressure up and I'm not happy at, at all, so he's complaining of belly pain, I'm worried we may have ruptured his spleen, and he could be bleeding internally, and so this is the normal thing you do, is try and give him some volume. I mean, that's really all we can do that I can think of right now, until we uh, get to a, a hospital. Props have been damaged. We've got a maximum speed of five knots. The older guy down there, his blood pressure is dropping. And uh, I, I'm concerned about him. I'm trying to negotiate with these three fishing boats here for one of them to take him up to the San Jose port. It would take us 80 hours to get there. They can be there in about two. Gato! Por favor, queremos hablar! Por favor! Su amigo necesita un hospital. Pero nosotros no podemos salir ahorita para allá. Tenemos que tenemos que amanecer por los equipos. What do we do with them? There's nothing for us to do. Our trouble is we we have to go back now and just. So the trouble is we, we can't dock anywhere near here. There's nowhere to dock a boat, to yeah, get a boat in. They can get him to shore fastest. And the guys are saying, you know, it's not really their responsibility as far as we can make our interpretation. Please call us immediately. Here's our sat phone, zero, zero. Earth Race has had a collision with what appears to be a small Guatemalan fish boat. They tend to sit off that coast and, uh, and drift at night, towing a net behind them with no lights. It's really common. See if their port prop is down and their starboard engine's down. That's like a really bad combination. And so that's back to the airport. Someone's in the water. They haven't been found. If somebody in the system of the Guatemalan Politico sees this and says, oh, you know, I'm going to make some money off of this. This is somebody else's tragedy, but I can step in 
and profit from this in some way. If I can head something like that off, just knowing that it's possible, uh, it gives us an edge to, uh, to hopefully stop such a situation from taking place. So but two are still alive. So I'm thinking a shipping vessel in Guatemala that's really small with no lights is an 18-foot boat with an outboard motor. Yeah, it's just is that what it was, an 18-foot I have no idea. Now, where is dolor? Or the we eventually managed to contact local Coast Guard and, uh, and Navy here. They've sent out a Navy vessel. We're making such slow progress. The only way this guy's going to survive is if we get him on this boat quickly and get him to a hospital. This guy, this guy climbed on the boat. My, my boat has sustained damage. I can only do six knots. His blood pressure is the same as when I last measured it on board, but it may just be supported by the saline infusion, and if he's continuing to bleed, it'll come down. And if we have to give him another two liters of saline and no blood, he's going to have trouble. I don't know if the, 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 the news is good for you or bad for you, I don't know. Guatemalan military personnel board the Earthrace vessel and inform the crew they are to be escorted into Guatemala and detained. The crew is safe. They're, they're being housed at the naval base. So the word got out that someone was killed in a boating accident in a local town. The word got out very quickly, and there's a, there's a potential for a significant security risk. And we need to talk. We need to explain to this kid that we need to get there now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's gotta he, go. He doesn't need to know why. He just yeah. needs to know that we need to get there now. Yeah. The local people are aware of the situation. Do know that a member of their community has been injured that um, there could be uh, bad feelings in the street, there could be an uprising, there could be taking the law into their own hands, but powers that be do not want a major scene. I think that uh, our familiar faces or familiar faces will be a good thing for the guys in the situation they're in. You know, we're confined to our boat uh, on a military base. They are going through all their paperwork right now, and we're just investing, they're getting just a general idea of what happened. Now, we have to be careful. You know, we, we have to let them know what happened, but we have to make sure that we are very clear about how we say things. And we saw the one who disappeared, we saw him. Yes? We saw him. Oh, we tried. We swam out, vanished, gone. You know, we, we haven't even left the boat yet. We're not cleared to leave the boat. Apparently there's a bunch of locals that are upset, right, you know, understandably about what's going on. Um, and there's a bunch of media, potentially a frenzy going on, so we're not quite sure what's happening. What's the, what's the authority that, they, that, that you people are from? From the government. So there's a government. He's from the police. From the police. Police. Okay. You have to, to stay here in uh -huh. the boat. Yeah. Uh, you can talk with your embassy in Guatemala yeah. and to, um, to have a, a lawyer yeah. that willing to represent you. Yeah. I think we, uh, we will find a lawyer tonight. Mm -hmm. Do you have the chance to, to, to make your first declaration? I, I would rather discuss it and, and have everything that happened out there in the open, but just the... I'm from New Zealand, not Guatemala. I, I yeah. need to have a lawyer here for me and my crew and uh, I'm not uh, worried, I'm just a little nervous. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
That's both the government. Oh, it's it's we, we need we need to have a merit we need yeah. to have a maritime oh, attorney yes. on call that we're discussing these factors with yeah. in case this doesn't work out in right. case it goes further. Cuando venga él quiero que ustedes vengan también. Lo lleve por seguridad. Yeah. Okay. Y el último que va a quedar con el barco es el capitán. The ultimate responsibility of the boat is yours. The third fisherman is presumed dead, and Gonzalez is in a critical condition. The crew are informed they will be held captive on the naval base. Far out. I didn't realize that towed it in. This is it. Unreal. What's in it? We are. I guess. We are. Definitely in it. There's an article there. I don't think there's an explosion. No. Man. What do they say? What they're basically saying is, um, this is a, hypo a hypothesis of what could have happened. They did it mention that one gentleman is still missing. What's this saying here? Is it saying that they've captured Captain of New Zealand? Zealand. We're effectively prisoners here, and they've said we're not able to leave the base. There is, uh, there is talk that there's some hostilities in, in town towards us, so I think it's also for our protection that they, they go leaving us here. We're still not allowed underneath the boat to check what damage there is. They've got, they've got these military police over here, they've got people patrolling out here with guns, um, but we don't know what damage is there. It's been a frustrating uh, couple of days so far. We're just getting the statement ready that will go to the court, and I believe from that they will then make a decision where it goes from there. I mean, it's, it's not easy here because you know, we're not sort of sure of all the customs uh, and how things work, and we've got various people advising us, and, and different people seem to say different things. So we're just trying to tread carefully through this minefield, you know. Four days into the Guatemalan experience, the crew is still detained. Charges haven't been laid yet, but it's apparent that charges are going to be laid against Pete, and morale was low. In the meantime, we need for you to sign this, and this is basically a, where you agreed to have legal representation. We represent you and your client. Yep. Uh, my travel agent left out the part about being arrested by the Guatemalan Navy and being restricted to their military base. We have a, a patrol boat um, of Guatemalan Navy kids who are barely 17, I think, with M16s that we, we, we just tossed a bunch of rum and cigarettes to that are guarding us, making sure that we don't leave in the dead of night. We are in the bowels of the deepest and darkest, worst bureaucracy that we could ever be trapped in. We were meant to be meeting with the judge about an hour ago, but it looks like once again there's another spanner in the works. It's just Groundhog Day. It's such a frustrating country to try and operate in. kicking a rugby ball out in their paddock there and I just rolled my ankle. I'm, it's looks, it looks really bad, but I'm hoping it's just a rolled ankle and nothing busted. Guatemala's starting to piss me off. 
Where's, where's Ellie and Scott and stuff? I've been sitting up there begging the commandant for three days now or something. Can I please get down to the boat? Can I please go take a look at the boat? There's a few chips and there's a few dings, but it's not that bad. Yeah, Ryan, I'm not really feeling much of anything <laughs> at all in general after this you know, five days ago. It's been a, kind of a, an emotional black hole. The US citizens, Dr. Stark and Anthony, were released quite quickly and immediately flew back to the US. Pete and I, being New Zealanders, were kept on the Navy base and everyone was unsure when we'd be released. So we've got my military police minders. I don't believe we are in the wrong on this. It's an accident that happened at sea and um, their vessel was not equipped to be out there. And yet I see this as we're still painted up as the bad guys in this and, and guilty. And, and yet when I look at the facts, I don't believe we are. No, no, Pete, let me explain something to you. What you're relating to me, okay, is your version of the facts. They will have their own version of the facts. Okay? If we have to continue the process in order to reconcile all the facts, then it would be a lengthy process. It would be a process that would take at least three years. If there's a settlement made to this family, it's not admission of no, no, guilt no, no. on any settlement is, is not admission of anything. They are holding us here without charge. Is that legal, what they're doing? Negligence, when there is a death, can rise to a uh, criminal penalty. And when there is a death or something like that, there's, there's sort of like a presumption that there is a crime somewhere. And my crew and I would like to express our deep sorrow about what's happened. Y quisiera expresar que yo lamento mucho lo que sucedió. And we did everything we could that night. Hicimos todo lo que pudimos esa noche. I'm sorry. Y lo lamento. Pete and I went and met the family of the killed fisherman. We actually went on the way to court where Pete, as skipper, faced charges of negligence causing death and up to 10 years in prison. Just in court now, proceedings are about to start and I'm quite nervous. <laughs> You're free to go. Free to go. Free to go. I told Man, am I relieved. Like it was quite, when the, when the prosecutor, um, when he was sort of reading out that it, they, they still wanted to proceed with the charges and I could feel my sort of stomach starting to churn. Um, just glad it's over. Tough week. She's preparing the note that we'll take to the base, the naval base, and the naval base will issue your clearance for you to, to leave. Man, it's been a tough week, isn't it? Sorry to put you through this. I love you, I love my kids. Freedom.
realmente lamentamos todo lo ocurrido. Lo que ocurrió. Oh. No hay nada que podamos hacer ahora, pero realmente. There's nothing we can do now, but we're very sorry for what's happened. Sacar fuerza de uno no no tiene. In the end, there was there was a total of 135,000. Uh, 135 grand that was paid to the families and I think kind of funny with the settlement like it's sort of in one way I saw it as us being guilty but you know, desperately poor people and I'm sort of quite happy to see a bit of money to go to the marine. Just uh, just getting the props on and uh, once we get these going we are leaving Guatemala and we've decided as a team we are going to carry on. Part of it we've had so many supporters who have gotten us to where we are today and can't just turn around and, and not carry on. With the settlement covered by insurance, the team is able to continue, and the race is on again. Did my first night shift since the collision last night and found it quite nerve-wracking. Um, you know, I've spent a year at the helm of this boat driving at night now and never had any problems. Did really ram it home to me just how dangerous it is driving at night. Anthony's left the boat crew, so Ali's joined us on board the boat. We're now 12 days behind cable and wireless, and it's only our third leg. track the boat here to see how it's going. You see here last night, they actually ducked behind this island here. Um, I think they had some pretty rough weather. Had a crappy, crappy night, and it feels like a prop's been damaged again. Can't see anything wrong with them. I am thinking how Allison is going to be because the whole team just went through a big heavy 10 foot seas for three days pounding into him at 20 some knots and I'm just hoping that Allison is coming out of this okay. We were flying in bed, literally. The yeah. whole body was lifting. I was flying in the engine room. Right? <laughs> How big a job is it to pull the entire gearbox? San Diego came with vibration all through the drivetrain, and we knew that if we didn't solve these vibration issues, that we would never be able to hold Earthrace at the speed that it takes to set the world record. We knew that the gearbox had been damaged in the collision. Uh, the gearbox that's failed is, needs to be replaced, so we're trying to get it out of the hatch. The hatch is too small, of course. After we get out of the engine bay, we have to get it off the boat. You okay? You okay? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I think we just snapped the filter housing off this other transmission. With the ZF engineers and ground crew having worked straight through the night installing the new gearbox, the boat is ready for an early morning departure for Hawaii. I feel now like our luck has to change. It's just been three legs of the worst luck imaginable. We've had more mechanical problems and hassles in the past three legs than we did in the 30,000 miles preceding the race. So I think uh, the next 10 legs, got to be sweet, got to be. Earth Race vessel just uh, attempted departure from San Diego, but suddenly is turning around, heading back to port. Don't know why, don't know what's going on, trying to reach them via VHF channel 16 right now. Without a response, so hopefully it's nothing significant.
I'm starting to think that Earthrace is jinxed. We had the, the issues with the propeller initially. It was in Panama. And then we had the, the uh, collision in Guatemala. Then last night we had to replace the gearbox. And then today we've got it all set up, headed out, and the drive shaft is moving like this. So just praying it's not a bent drive shaft. I don't think it is, but it's the engine misaligned or the, the coupling misaligned, something's not right there. And it's like we are jinxed on Earth Race. It was a bent drive shaft. And the time it will take us to pull it, straighten it, and realign the engine meant that the record temp was now effectively out of our reach. Yeah, don't stop! Jesus Christ, man! Look at the area! We had wasted so much time between Guatemala and the repairs in San Diego that we decided that we would start the race again in San Diego. The idea that, that we would start the race again, it didn't come easy. We'll see you in Hawaii! I hated the idea that we'd start the race again, that everything we'd done was for nothing, and that we'd be beginning 24,000 nautical miles from scratch. Don't come back now, you hear? Hey, bad time you bugger off. So Scott and Ali headed to Hawaii to meet the boat, and I flew to Singapore in order to set up the Asian port stops. And Earthrace was now flying across the Pacific, and she had this extra 500 litre tote on the back of the boat in order to increase her speed, which was great, but that also meant that I had to find even more fuel for the boat. And one thing about the project that always worried me was Earthrace not being able to get the record for the reason only of me not being able to source the fuel. With the restart and a trouble-free leg, the Earth Race breaks the world record for a San Diego to Hawaii crossing, arriving with a three-day lead on cable and wireless. We're having to dodge whales. Oh, they're coming in right on time right now. Look how light they are. They've got no fuel left. Well, it was the nicest leg we've had on this race thus far. No fishing boats, no prop problems. Didn't have any major issues. Made good time, which is nice for a change. With the boat moving quickly across the massive Pacific lakes, the ground crew is left to sort through two major problems. The team's almost exhausted cash supply and getting tens of thousands of litres of biodiesel to tiny Pacific islands. We're with Earth Race, and that flight is $900. That's just killing us. This is a round-the-world race, and what we're trying to do is to raise consciousness of alternative fuels. Isn't there any way that you can, like, lower that price from $900 to something reasonable. There's three of us that have to fly all the way to Palau. Can you do something for us? <laughs> we just got a discount. Our first airline discount. Okay, nothing over here, all that's deep. Okay, so if we come around right here, we can just go right around into that point right there, no problem? No problem. No problem. No problem. Okay. Our fuel right now is in a big plastic bag inside of a container, being loaded onto a truck and heading our way. Bodies was a logistical nightmare and a major pain in the ass. 
and I had my own race to get the fuel down to the dock before the boat arrived. I was having to get all of the fuel sponsored and also having to find shipping companies that would be prepared to ship the fuel to some of the most isolated places on earth free of charge. A fuel stop is supposed to be four hours, and it takes four days of planning to prepare for this four hours. And from the time that Earth Race pulls in and docks, you're sweating, you're moving as quickly as you can at, at every moment because every step has been listed out. It's the most intense four hours that one could possibly spend. I've got some drunk guy up there screaming at me that the bottom of the hull doesn't need cleaning. There's nothing to draw on it. That's probably from about two square inches of the hull. So why would you get down here and clean the hull right now? I don't understand that part, okay? Simple. No problem. I love you. It's hard to get back on the boat. And you get to touch land for four or five hours and then you just got to jump back straight on this boat and start smacking yourself around at sea again and you start to affect me. I've spent my life on boats. I make my living on boats. Everything I do revolves around boats, making boats move. And out of my 150,000 sea miles, Earth Race is the most uncomfortable boat that I have ever been on. It, it isn't even in the same ballpark as, as any other boat. It's, it's beyond belief what you live through on that boat. With the boat steaming towards the Palau Islands, the ground crew fly into the capital, Karor, only to be greeted by some bad news. So we've been trying for about six weeks to get fuel shipped to Karor and just found out we're having to refuel with diesel there, which is a real piss off. Marty, our engineer, was allergic to diesel, so it meant that he had to get off the boat. It was a real blow to the team, with the whole ethos of the project being to promote renewables. Marty's decided to get off in Palau. OK, how are you with heat? Of all places, this is really the worst place to get off. You think you can make Singapore in six days? There is a worldwide shortage of marine engineers. When a mega yacht is looking for a marine engineer, they can't even find one. And they've got all the money in the world to pay. And our engineer decided in Palau that he was going to get off the boat. And this really left us stranded high and dry. This is our third engineer of the race. Now we're in this remote Pacific island, truly one of the most remote places in the world and we're looking for an engineer who will work for free in miserable condition. I don't know where we're gonna get another engineer. It's pretty expensive to fly someone in and out of here. The, boats, the boat can get pretty hot. Now let me tell you, the heat is oppressive. <laughs> it's ugly and it has a life of its own. <laughs> and I have never experienced anything like this. This apple is actually warm, almost like an apple pie warm. And so I've never had a texture like it. It's like biting into applesauce. It almost runs out of the skin. It's bizarre. The Pacific really has been monotonous. It's just so empty and so big. There is no proper delineation between one day and the next on the boat. It's pretty much broken up into a six hour cycle for the permanent crew. So you've got two hours driving, then you've got four hours off. You always feel half guilty waking someone for their shift when you've finished. Where are we? Just had this vibration starting to come through, and then there's this smoke everywhere. And white smoke is, a, is a, typically a bad thing. Just running on one engine now, and Still don't know what the problem is. Did any fault codes come up on the computer on your EDM when you were running? Well, that's all bad news. Everyone's pretty down, just crashed out. It means an extra day on the boat as well, traveling at this slow speed.
uh, we very well may end up having to take the engine apart, lift the engine, if everything went really smooth. Uh, 48 hours of constant work, maybe 24 hours. Unbelievable. Well, this is a starboard engine, number one cylinder, and that piston down there has pretty well come to bits. That means that it's another delay. We have to wait for a piston, a piston liner. We have to drop the pan, lift the piston, lift the piston liner out, and change the head. We got parts in the air. We got a new head on one shipment. They were sent yesterday, but when they're going to arrive, we don't know. We still don't have a shipping number. You hear some horror stories here about something's taken a week to get here by a FedEx or UPS. So the Cummins guys have turned up here and the piston is not with their stuff. So now we're stuck with these two technicians here or everything we need except for a piston. Might as well be all of it or minus a piston. Either way, we're still waiting. Race rules state that when a boat is in port, time still accumulates against the team's total record time, regardless of the reasons for the vessel stoppage. Every morning I get up and it's like Groundhog Day. Oh, the piston hasn't arrived, the tracking number hasn't come, and I think the um, team's all fed up with it. We've all had enough. The finances snuck up on us a bit. Like, on the boat you just assume it's fine. And then we get here and we find there's no fuel, so we're having to, to buy diesel, which pisses me off. Everything is just sort of accumulating at the moment. It's a pretty, um, pretty depressing time right now. Well, the piston arrived. The plan is we're gonna put the piston in tonight. What this does, it allows us to leave tomorrow at probably two, three, four in the afternoon. We'll get out of Palau. For me, Palau was a low point of the race. We literally didn't have enough money to fly the ground crew out of Palau, nor did we have fuel arranged for the boat, which means that we needed 3,000 gallons of diesel fuel. And so we came up with a plan. We went straight to all of the media outlets and started a big hype. There's two seats left over. You can get on this boat. You can be part of history. Welcome to a special report. I'm joined with Scott Fratcher. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Earth Race? And sure enough, we found one person out of the whole island community that was willing to ride the boat. And she, in some way, saved the Earth Race project. With repaired engines, the boat departs for Singapore with a new engineer on board. Our engineer that flew into Palau wasn't particularly fond of the boat. And when we arrived in Singapore, made it pretty clear that he wouldn't be continuing on the rest of the voyage. It's an absolute nightmare, to be quite honest. It's filthy, it's unorganized, uh, it's dangerous. Um, yeah, and it surprised me that I actually got to leave New Zealand. Well, here she is. Looks like Earth Race has made Singapore safe and sound. We've got three and a half thousand gallons sponsored, yep. and I wonder if we turn up and say, can you give us another 500? Are they going to cough up that easy enough? Uh, I can call them, see what's, oh, the tank is on its way. As far as fuel and cash, we're down to four grand US. No immediate money on the horizon. So I guess, what do we do from here? Um, I don't know how we can do it unless we get some money in. With an entire tank of biodiesel already sponsored, the boat is able to leave Singapore. But without more funds coming in, the challenge will end in India. It's about 2,000 nautical miles to India. We've got about 600 to get up through the Straits of Malacca, and that should be pretty flat. But once we get out the top of that, the forecast is going to be pretty rough. Pretty light on crew, only three, which is really the minimum you need to run this boat. Uh, got a new guy, Peter, on board. Just scragged him off the dock here in Singapore. Drum 
arms are just starting to shift around with all the uh, all the motion. And down here, you can see there's a whole lot of liquid. So I'm just praying that that liquid is all biodiesel. This is gonna stink here. Right. Here's the culprit here. The drum's completely empty. Crack run on the bottom. We got five drums of fuel in here. Four of them biodiesel. One of them is diesel. And it just happens to be that that's the one that's burst. Fumes are overpowering. And we got diesel fuel all through the sleeping quarters, so probably means we're going to sleep in the helm tonight. Risky bloody business, this. Oh! Yeah, this is my first attempt at cooking in here. Just a bit rougher than today. With the boat en route and only two days from Cochin, the ground crew arrive in India to discover that the biodiesel fuel they'd organised is yet to arrive at the fuel dock. Yes, fuel is not here. We're calling the fuel sponsor, we're calling the people who ship the fuel. No, fuel last we heard was still at the border. And Earthrace is suitably angry, of course. They're all laying in fetal position on the back half of the boat, trying to sniff fresh air through the crack in the door. Last night, when I knew we were coming into India, I just wasn't excited at all. I was just so exhausted and so sick of being on the boat. But now, coming in and seeing this place, it is so, so different. I hope that they've managed to get us a shore pass so that we can at least get away from the dock for an hour. You got two thousand two hundred. What happened on the leg from uh, Singapore? We just had headwinds for three days and. Just, a, just slamming the whole way. And what it's done is it's gradually fatigued the middle bolts and two of the engine mounts. So half the engine is, is basically unfixed at the moment. Just as we came into dock, there was a funny noise coming from the port engine. So kind of stressful, actually. Oh, that's lovely. If there's not something wrapped around the prop, we've got a serious okay. problem here. So I've got my fingers crossed there's a bit of rope or twine or something wrapped around it. It's clear. Oh, the water's filthy, but the prop shafts are clear and the props themselves. That's really disappointing to hear. I thought we'd had that all worked out so that we could move the boat and the crew could get off the boat with crew passes. Looks like the crew can't get off right now. The shipping agent is going to continue to work with that. I thought we'd had it all worked out. The engine mounts have snapped on Earth Race, but it's Sunday in India and we can't find new bolts because nobody's open today. But this boat has a lathe on board that we kind of sur surreptitiously heard about. So we're trying to get their engineer to make us new bolts. Hey, how's it going? I'm Scott. Hi. Fatou. Hey, that's great. I think we can There's do something. Stay lifted, huh? Strong. Okay. Our fuel truck was supposed to be here, but the gate will be locked soon, so he won't be able to come tonight. But there's a side to this. According to Cochin lore, this is the fastest that a yacht has ever been checked in to Cochin. We have broke all the records for getting a yacht checked into Cochin, so... Well, we're going to break one f***ing record then. <laughs> <laughs> fuel hasn't turned up. The truck left uh, where it was coming from 48 hours ago, so we're still waiting on that. Not quite sure where that is. The mosquitoes here are just vicious and we're all being eaten alive. I don't think any of us had any sleep last night. It was a crappy night. Still trying to figure out how we're going to get our fuel here. I'm just in limbo kind of thing. The fuel truck hasn't actually made it across the border. Which is all bad, really. Well, um, at the moment, uh, they know that it was 12,000 litres, so that's a good thing. That means that, uh, that they know enough that, uh, that they had real contact. We've all come down in these rashes and we're not even allowed off the boat. There's no law. The only reason we're not allowed off is just because some dude over there has just gone, mm, nah, you can't have a shore pass. Mm, nah. I'm stuck here at this really scenic dock. This contraption over there has been going since 6 this morning. Come on, come on. 
Buddy, this is the first live thing I've seen in this river, and it looks like it's almost dead. Uh, Lance is going to rescue it if he gets his own, the G. Look at that for an out of it bird. Well, you can chuck him in one of those bins and keep warm and let him dry out at least. And hopefully, we can bring him back to life. I think there's seven of us in this engine room right now, and we are yet again aligning an engine. With the engine mounts installed and final alignments being made, only biodiesel is needed for departure. But with no fuel in sight, frustration reigns. Just sort of seeing the the record slip away from us here, sitting in, yeah. in bloody India, um, waiting on fuel that was supposedly ready for us weeks ago. They won't even give us a shore pass to allow us to get to shore and work on things. We're stuck in this damn boat here, like lepers. Yes, India. Yes, India. Hey. Okay, I, I need to leave tomorrow, mate. Like, I, honestly, this is just killing us now, eh? I need to leave here tomorrow. Tonight, gourmet fish for our little friend if he's still alive. <laughs> but the most important thing, I have shore passes for you guys. This particular biodiesel that we're taking on here came from the oil from fish. And so, what that means is it's kind of a uh, semi new technology for, uh, for the biodiesel industry. Uh, the quality of the fuel and that is not looking particularly good. In fact, I would say that's looking particularly bad. It looks pretty dodgy, actually. And I'm worried if we were to go and run this, it's going to uh, stuff our engines. So after waiting all this time for the biodiesel, we might end up having to reject the fuel and fill up with normal diesel, which we could have done on the first day. The team are forced to order a tanker of conventional diesel. The Indian fuel sponsor agrees to cover the cost. And with John Allen having had some success in raising funds in Oman, the race can continue. However, with the fuel not arriving until the evening, the crew have 10 more hours in coach in. Falcor survived. Now we're risking it from being tangled. Oh, wicked talons, eh? Be tangled in. woke up and it was quiet and obviously there is something very very wrong because neither of the engines are going. You can hear the guys working away down in the engine bay but just too nervous to go down and find out what's gone wrong. Isolated a thousand miles from land, the boat crew faced days drifting at sea if unable to start the boat. Check the boat this morning on the GPS and she's been stationary for about eight hours and has drifted six miles east. Um, I can't raise her on the satellite phone or the email. I'm wondering what would take both engines down. It could be, it could be electrical. They've been drifting for six to eight hours now. Monumental cock up. We ran out of fuel in our day tank overnight. My fault, there really is no excuse for um for not checking the level. In trying to start it, we damaged the lift pump, which is like a primary pump that lifts fuel to the main pump. We're all back together, and uh, it's not starting. Still no difference there, eh? No. It's been a long morning. Got oh, morning. Running out of shots on this. Running out of battery soon. There it is! Suck yeah. on that one! Alright. Nice one! We are out of here! 
looks like they're rolling again. Anybody want to? She's back up and running again. Oh, she is? Yeah. Speed, 30 knots. They're on their way. Diesel from Malaysia has turned up in these 44 gallon drums. Our Somali brothers here came up with the bright idea of using this tyre to get the barrels down. Problem solved. Okay, we're, we're professionals. This really awesome bunch of dudes here from a Somalian cargo boat have helped us move all these cargo barrels and we can begin refueling. We need to get more stuff done beforehand. Well, there's no point getting you here the day before if we just leave it till we set up. Say for the refueling, we should see if we can have it all set up so that the boat pulls in. And we start refueling, you know. We weren't permitted to open it until this morning when the police could come. The boat's ready to leave, watered, grocery, all the mechanical stuff taken care of. I asked the agent about 20 minutes ago to get the paperwork. Uh, Control, your number yep. 902, your clearance. 902. See you Three meters, and I'm really sorry to hear that. No, it sounds dismal. Sounds just absolutely horrible. We're about halfway up the Red Sea, and the weather has been crap. I'm not really sure what the ground crew think. I think they they sort of think of it as a little bit of a holiday. Uh, you know, there's talk of them yesterday heading off to the pyramids. We get the record for getting the boat round the globe and they've really let us down on the last few stops. India was appalling with the fuel not ready and various other things. You spend three or four days at sea getting smacked around trying to save yourself an hour or two. It's just incredibly frustrating. I can understand the, the frustration of the crew on the boat. They're at sea, they have no clue what's happening on shore. I would think they really had no idea what was going on on our end of the project. The struggle we were working through with um, moving diesel, moving biodiesel, finding money. Just in Port Suez, in the Suez Canal, We've been advised that no cameras are allowed, that the canal is considered a military zone in Egypt, and that absolutely no filming is permitted. We've been told that we'll go to jail if we're caught with uh, cameras. Just exiting the Suez Canal now, and we made really good time through here. We're on our way to Malacca in Spain, and the first couple of days should be fine, but after that it should be quite crappy. And there's really no slack in the schedule from here. We have got so little spare time. Yes. 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 The boys are heading into a gale, straight into it, straight on the nose. This is probably going to be the worst conditions of the whole circumnavigation. Just grinding us down, and the forecast is for it to be like this in the next two days, which will take us all the way to Spain. This will cost us maybe at least half a day, more likely a day. So once again, I'm cooking in the rough stuff. As the boat approaches Spain, the ground crew prepare the dock, and with the storm abating, the boat crew are able to inspect the engines which have been emitting error signals. 
And there's a, a whitey blue smoke coming from the exhaust of both engines. Doesn't bode well for us. Other than some blood, I guess just fine. Is that what's been happening? Yeah, starting uh, starting last night. It's like basically the, the boat just hurdles off waves and when it slams into a trough, it's like being dropped, you know, four or five feet onto cement. It's a little hard on the kidneys. Things go from bad to worse when the team discover water gushing into the forward section of the boat. With the Cummins engineers on hand, diagnostics on the engines begin immediately. It's all bad right now. You can tell from the galley how bad the trip was. There's lots of spilled food in here, and it's kind of a mess. Man, this is going to cost us. You have a look, Scotty. Yeah. It looks like it started around the transducer there, and there's a crack has propagated forward from it, and so we've got water. I wouldn't say gushing in, but, but not far off it. Your route is gonna originate just north of where the hurricanes pass, and it's gonna end just south of where the hurricanes pass. The route that you're about to take is gonna be just right down Hurricane Alley, and so, you know, like if something were to form around you. So I think we do this, we, we repair the, the uh, cracks as best we can. I mean, that's quite a serious something right there. With the press aware this could end the race, Pete talks with the media, while the crew attempt to makeshift repair on the hull. OK, so we've got the bottom shored up as best we can. I mean, it really looks like between the two layers that the foam has just lost its integrity. Is it still leaking? I wouldn't actually classify it as a leak. I think I would say it's like seeping. Time it's to go. Gonna... Stop. Time <laughs> to go. Go, BC! Without time for full repairs, the crew head for the Canary Islands, hoping that the boat and engines will hold together. Heaps of water in it now. Oh, man. Well, how much water is coming in? Does it get any worse than this, man? Arkin, this is it. Arkin. Can you see where it's leaking? Yeah, the old the transducer down there, it's sort of come loose from the hull. And there's a little crack all the way around it. And that's the I mean the water's just going up through there. We're in big trouble. Doesn't look Sort of weighing on me pretty heavily right now with this, eh? You know, I'm just, I'm just worn out. You know, like coming back in now, it's like, nah, that's it. We do hit one decent storm out there, and man, this boat, boat is at serious risk. Well, you know, 50% of your remaining miles will be right through hurricane zone during hurricane season. When I look at, I got, I got problems with the engines. I got this delamination happening up there. It's an accumulation of things that seem to be just making this look less and less like if I had good engines I'd probably be a lot more inclined to do it but I'm, my tendency now is to say I, I think we've I think we've done our dash <laughs> it's just not meant to be I thought we deserved this yeah we, we, we thought we deserve this don't we yeah. we deserve it mate the amount of we've had after four years of building touring and racing the decision to stop is made, with the team just two legs from completing their circumnavigation in Barbados. Disappointed. Weird feeling, really. Um, just gone through this little area, 15 foot by 8 foot wide. Been my home for over a year now, getting all my little nicks and pieces from all the different crannies of the boat. 
filling them into one bag. It's kind of like the end of a chapter now. It's a few people moving on. You know, we said we'd get the record and we gave it our best shot, which is all we can do. But to, to still miss it is, is heartbreaking. Oh, I'm pretty bummed out. Pretty bummed out. Not really angry, just a bit emotional, just a bit. Despite all the troubles, I always thought we'd somehow pull it off. <laughs> I've got to figure out what to do with the with the boat now. Is uh, maybe maybe put a team together and have a crack next year. But I, I've got to stave off bankruptcy. I might have to go home and get a job <laughs> or something. <laughs> the team established a base in Valencia and began repairs on the boat and fundraising for another record attempt. One year later, Pete made a second attempt at the record. They completed the circumnavigation in 65 days, smashing the existing record by 10 days. The body of Pajarito, the missing fisherman, was never found. Feel the warmth of the rocks underfoot Wondering what all the fuss was about Listening to what my brother played Just to have 